Could I bid each of you a very warm welcome along to our service here this morning. We're glad to see you. The psalmist tells us in the Psalm 84, how amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. We often say, uh, absent makes the heart fonder. And it's been at least eight weeks since we've been able to gather uh, in this fashion in the house of God. And certainly today we do appreciate uh, this opportunity. And we know that the Lord is here in a way that he is not in any other place. We're going to commence our worship this morning by singing the hymn number one. We're singing just three verses of this hymn. We're asking you just to keep your seats and to sing it softly uh, this morning. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Keeping our seats while we sing. Thank you. Let us just bow together in prayer. We encourage you to lift your heart and to ask for the Lord's presence and for his speaking voice to us here this Sabbath morning. Our gracious God and eternal Heavenly Father, we're conscious today that we're coming before one who is infinite, eternal, one who possesses all power and might, who is righteous. And we come humbly into thy presence. We recognize this morning as we do so, uh, like this, the hymn writer, to all life thou givest. We recognize, Lord, that the very breath that we breathe this morning is a gift from thy hand. And we bow this morning before thee, praising thee for health and the strength that we enjoy. Like the psalmist, we would cry today, how amiable, are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Lord, we confess that we have missed this opportunity to gather in this fashion. And we thank you this morning for an open door. And we pray that thou wouldst help us to worship thee in spirit and in truth, that our worship this morning might be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight. We ask, Lord, that even in these days that thou wouldst continue to keep your hand upon us. We thank thee for thy hand even over this last year, and we pray keep us safe in this house, even from this virus, uh, that it would not be spread. Uh, but we pray, Lord, that thou wouldst 
Help us to commit our way every day, even into thy hand. We do remember, Lord, those this morning who would love to be in the house of God, but because of illness are unable to be here. We do remember, Lord, especially this morning, Mr. and Mrs. Hall, we pray that you would be with them in hospital. We pray that you'd be pleased especially to touch Mrs. Hall, and that even today that there might be progress uh, in her situation. We thank you, Lord, for Ashley being able to be home, and we pray that you would continue to keep your good hand upon him in the days that lie ahead as well. Others, Lord, who are recovering from coronavirus, we pray that thou wouldst continue to be with them, give them fresh strength and fresh help every day. We know, Lord, there's others, and they're not well with other illnesses at this time as well. We think especially of our sister, Mrs. Walker. Uh, we thank you even for her being able to move from the hospital to the home. Uh, we pray that you would keep your hand upon her, that you would encourage her, that you would guide the doctors, and, Lord, that she might know uh, steadily fresh strength with every passing day. Remember, Lord, Mrs. Highlands and others, too, that are not well at this time. Mrs. Beatty, we pray that you draw near to her and fa their families as well, and that you would undertake for them. We come, Lord, this morning to worship Thee, and we pray that as we open up the Word of God, help us to recognize afresh that this is Thy Word given to us for our instruction. We pray, Lord, as we read the Scriptures, that Thou wouldst give to us even that submission of heart, that whatever the Scriptures say, that we might be willing to bow our knee before them and to seek to do Thy will in our lives. To that end, Lord, we ask that as we come this morning to preach the Word, that we might know Thy help and that we might hear Thy voice and that we might, even as the priest or the high priest would come through that gate, come to the brazen altar, come to the laver, enter into the holy place, and then pass through the veil. Lord, we pray that we might be able this morning to pass through the veil, that we might have communion with thee, that we might hear thee speaking even to our hearts, that thou wouldst sanctify us, make us more in thine image even in these days. We pray, Lord, that thou wouldst be with us now this morning. Pour out thy Spirit upon us and do us good. For, Lord, we pray in thy name and for thy glory. Amen. Amen. We're turning in our Bibles this morning to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus, and to the chapter 25. The book of Exodus and the chapter 25. We've been studying the tabernacle. In fact, uh, the first Sunday was the first Sunday of lockdown. How quickly the weeks have gone by. This is our ninth week in considering the tabernacle. And we're coming to the Ark of the Covenant. We read there in the verse 10 of Exodus 25. And they shall make an ark of siddim wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without shalt thou overlay it. And thou shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it and put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings shall be in the one side of it and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of sittim wood and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims 
on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Amen. We know that God will bless the reading of his own precious word to each of our hearts. We have been considering uh, the uh, tabernacle over these last number of weeks. I think in the brightness of the church, the picture may not be as clear as it would have been on your television in previous uh, weeks. But just again to remind you, you have there a picture of the tabernacle itself divided into two parts, the holy place and the holy of holies. In the holy place, there was the candlestick, the table of showbread, and then there was the golden altar of incense. And then in the next slide, we have a picture of the veil, the veil uh, divided between the holy place and the holies of holies. It was woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, along with embroidered designs of cherubims. The veil was hung on four pillars of Achaia wood, and they were overlaid with pure gold. The veil hung from four gold hooks that were put in four sockets of silver. And of course, you'll remember that uh, in the temple, uh, when Christ died, that veil was rent in twain, or the veil, this was the one in the tabernacle, the one in the temple when it was built, uh, was rent not from the bottom up, but it was rent from the top down. God rent the veil uh, in two, throwing the way open between the holy place right into the holy of holies. In the next slide, we're coming to the piece of furniture that we're considering this morning. In fact, there's two pieces of furniture there. At first glance, you might think there's one, but there's two. There is the Ark of the Covenant, and then there is sitting on the top of it, there is the mercy seat. The Ark of the Covenant was to be made of a kaya wood, and it was to be overlaid with gold. And inside and outside with a gold crown of molding set around the top edge. You'll also notice that there was four rings uh, on the Ark of the Covenant, and then through those rings they pushed the two rods or the two staves that they could carry them with them. And it's interesting to note that those staves were not taken out. Those staves were laid in. If you can see the size of it, roughly, it was two and a half uh, cubits long. That's about three feet, nine inches long. And then it was one and a half cubits wide, two feet, three inches wide. And then it was two feet, uh, three inches high. So it was not that uh, big. It was a relatively small piece of furniture. In the next slide, we're given a glimpse inside the Ark of the Covenant. You'll know that there was three things inside the Ark of the Covenant. There was the rod, uh, Aaron's rod that budded, and then there was the pot, and inside the pot there was the manna, which fell in the wilderness every morning except the Sabbath, and which fed the children of Israel. And then also importantly, within the Ark, there were the tables of the law. So that's what we're thinking about this morning. Not so much about the mercy seat. We want to look at the mercy seat next week, but we're looking today at the Ark of the Covenant. So I trust you'll be able to keep that picture in your mind, and then when I begin to talk about it, you might have a better idea as to what it is that I am speaking about uh, this morning. At this stage of a service, I'm going to ask uh, one of our elders, Mr. Tom, to come and to make the announcements for the incoming week. Well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome back to the house of God this morning. We're very glad to see you out, and we trust that the Lord will bless us as we meet here together to worship Him in His own appointed way. 
I'd just like to welcome those online as well. You're most welcome as you join with us this morning. And just a wee reminder, if you uh, perhaps were unaware that we had returned to church and you're able to get out this evening, you'd be most welcome along here to the church this evening at 7 p.m. So here are the announcements then for the incoming week. <clears throat> and uh, Sorry, my device has just gone off. <laughs> if you just give me a moment, folks. Okay, so this afternoon, the Sunday school is at 3 p.m. on Facebook, as per normal, and the Bible class is at 4 p.m. again on Facebook. This evening's service will take place here in the church and also online at 7 p.m., and our own minister, the Reverend Murray, will be the preacher. Uh, just for this evening service, there will be no time of prayer before the service, but I would encourage you to take time at home to pray for the service this evening. The midweek meeting this week is on Tuesday night at 8 p.m. and will be held here in the main church auditorium. Reverend Murray will be the speaker this Tuesday, and that message will also be online as usual. <clears throat> just a word from Mrs. Irwin about the Beeline meeting. Uh, this week at the B line, the guest speakers are Simon and Hannah Snodgrass. And she says, We are really looking forward to them coming, and we invite you all to tune in on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live. The B line is now being aired not only on Facebook Live, but also on Sermon Audio and YouTube. And all ages are welcome to tune in for that B line meeting. A gift of £20 and another gift of £100 was given towards the work of the Beeline, for which we are most grateful. Next week, then, the services will be at the normal times of 11.30 a.m. and 7 p.m. here in the church, each preceded by a time of prayer 45 minutes before the service. And the Reverend Murray, God willing, will be the speaker at both those services next Lord's Day, and the services continue online as well. Also next Lord's Day, the Sunday School is at 3 p.m. on Facebook, and the Bible class is at 4 p.m. on Facebook. Uh, just on the tables at the doors, you probably noticed that there are copies of the Vision magazine. Recently, our church committee voted to provide this magazine free of charge to anyone in the congregation. So if you have not already obtained the most recent copy and wish to do so, do please feel free to lift a copy as you leave the meeting this morning. Those who previously were subscribers to the Vision magazine do not need to renew your subscription. And then a notice about um, the deputation we had several weeks ago from Mr. Andrew Foster from Uganda. And Mr. Murray did mention online that if you wish to contribute towards that deputation meeting, um, that you could possibly do so when you return to church. So if you still wish to give to Mr. Andrew Foster on that work in Uganda, uh, do put something in an envelope and write his name on it, and you could leave it in the plates here in the church now that you're back to church. That's if you wish to do that. Could I just ask the congregation to please remember in prayer the many who are ill or unwell, who have serious illness, or who have COVID, or who are in hospital. Uh, Mr. Murray, in his prayer this morning, has mentioned some of those people. Uh, there are quite a lot in our church who are unwell at the present time. Do remember them in your prayers. I'm sure you have been, folks. But do continue to remember them, that the Lord's hand would be upon them, and that the Lord would bless them. That's all by way of announcements. Thank you very much. Can I thank our brother for making those necessary announcements? Do you remember the service tonight at seven? And I want to consider tonight and our service the day that God wept. So you'll be welcome to come and join with us uh, again this evening. Before we turn to God's word, let's just stand for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity of coming before thee. We thank thee that Thou art our sacrifice, and we rejoice that because Thou didst finish that work of atonement, that we can come into Thy presence. Help us, Lord, to come by the labor. We pray that You'd wash us by the water of Thy precious Word this morning, and that Thou wouldst 
draw us closer even unto thyself. We thank you, Lord, that these things were written for our learning, and we pray that thou wouldst teach us from thy word, all oh, that we might see more of Christ our Redeemer. And so, Lord, to that end, I ask thee for help. Bring to my thoughts that which thou would have us to say. And, Lord, we ask that we might not only learn dimensions and views, but that our hearts might be touched and that our hearts might be molded and that we might be drawn closer even unto thyself. So, Lord, be thou our help, uh, for I pray in thy name and for thine glory. Amen. We're coming this morning, as we've said, to the Ark of the Covenant, Exodus the chapter 25. Read there in that verse 10. And they shall make an ark of siddim wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. In these verses, we are drawn to the Ark of the Covenant. It is perhaps the most famous of all the pieces of furniture within the tabernacle. Not only is it mentioned 180 times in the Word of God, but films such as the Raiders of the Lost Ark have been made about it. As a consequence, much speculation has risen concerning its current location, while some believe that it lies buried beneath the ruins of the temple in Jerusalem, others believe that it was carried away into Ethiopia. However, its present location is not important. It was but a type or a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting to note that in telling them to build the tabernacle, he told them first to build the Ark of the Covenant. In building a house, uh, we usually build the house. And then when the house is finished, we then begin to think about the furniture that we're going to put into the house. However, God's ways are not our ways. Before mentioning the gate or the outer fence or even the brazen altar, he tells them here to build, to build this ark of the covenant. Of course, it not only speaks to us of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it was also the Lord's throne upon earth. Again, the children of Israel coming to the river Jordan. We find that the ark was to go down before them. In other words, this Ark of the Covenant was always to be first. It was to be first in preparation. It was to be first as they made their procession, even down towards the River Jordan. And you see, Christ is not only first in regard to his existence, but he ought to be first in regard to our existence. Nothing should come before him. Indeed, the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking there in the Sermon on the Mount, he said in Matthew chapter 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In the previous verses, he had been speaking about there, about food and clothing. And in telling them to seek first his kingdom, he was not telling them here to forget about their food or to forget about their clothing, but he was merely telling them to get their priorities right. Christ and his kingdom was to come before everything else. And you see, Christ is not only preeminent, but he ought to be preeminent. He is before everything else, and therefore in our lives, he ought to be before everything else. It reminds me of the professor on Gilligan's Island. He discovered how to turn banana peels into diesel, and he discovered how to make chocolate fudge out of algae but he failed to fix the hole in the bottom of his boat to get him off the island. And so often in life, we are so busy doing this, and we're so busy doing that, that we feel as it were to fix the hole on the bottom of our boat. You see, what is important today is Christ. Christ should be preeminent. Christ should be before 
everything and before everyone else. He who makes or offers the Lord second place in reality offers him no place. Because if the Lord is second place, then in reality that thing that you have put first has become an idol in your life. You see, believer Christ should be first. He should be preeminent in our thoughts. He should be before every other duty. He should be before every other person, every other thing in our lives. And so I want to draw your attention this morning to the Ark of the Covenant in which we have a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice firstly here the chest of the Ark. It was three feet nine inches long, two feet three inches wide, and two feet three inches high. And as such, it was not even as high as the golden altar. And set on top of it was the mercy seat. But I want you to notice here its construction. While overlaid within and without with gold, we read in verse 10, And they shall make an ark of sittim wood, Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. It was to be made of sittim wood. Of course, sittim wood came from the Achaia tree growing out of the earth. It's, it was extremely hard, durable, and it was close green. Davies tells us it was indestructible by insects. Indeed, in the Septuagint, which is the first Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, it is rendered there as incorruptible wood. In other words, this wood, it was imperishable. Not only the insects, but even the elements were powerless against it. In other words, this wood, which speaks to us of the person of Christ, speaks to us of his humanity, it was indestructible, and it was incorruptible. You see, Christ's human nature was not only pure, but it was preserved. It could not be defiled nor destroyed. Indeed, summarizing his life, the apostle Paul, taking up his pen, he said in Hebrews 4 verse 15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Coming up into the wilderness, the Lord Jesus Christ was attacked physically. He was attacked emotionally. He was attacked spiritually. And yet Paul tells us here that he was without sin. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, in the verse 14, we are told that in order for temptation to succeed, the individual must be deceived. However, Christ, knowing all things, he could not be deceived, and therefore, he could not sin. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ was not only not corrupted, but he was in corruptible. He could not be defeated. He could not be defiled in any way. Sometimes people objecting, they say, well, if the Lord Jesus Christ could not sin, if the Lord Jesus Christ could not fall, yeah, when he was taken up into the wilderness and he was tempted, his temptations were not real. I ever think of it. A little rowing boat could go out to battle and it could attack a great battleship. Now, there is no possibility that that little rowing boat is ever going to sink the battleship, but nevertheless, its attack is just as real. And while the Lord Jesus Christ was tempted, while he was attacked by Satan on many fronts, he never sinned. In fact, the very demons of hell, lifting their voice, they cried out, Thou art the Holy One of God. But isn't it sad this morning that the very demons spawned in hell are more honest, more upright than some ministers and pulpits today? 
because they would tell us that Christ sinned. They would tell us that Christ failed. My Davies tells us that Christ sinned when he went to the cross. But my friend, Christ was sinless. Not only did he not sin, but there was no possibility in any circumstances of him ever sinning. You see, this morning, if we're going to be like him, then we need to be holy. If we're going to be like him, we need to resist temptation in our lives. But I think we notice not only its construction, but we notice also here its covering. We're told in chapter 26 and the verse 34, And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. It was to be kept in the holy of holies. None were permitted to enter into this sacred chamber except the high priest, and that only once a year, being dark and carrying with them incense, the ark, as he would have looked at it, it would have been obscure. It would not have been clear to his view. Again, in Numbers chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, we discover that the tabernacle being dismantled, the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies was then lowered over the Ark of the Covenant. And then over it was a covering of badger skin and over it was a cloth of blue. And as such, the ordinary priest, the ordinary Levite, he never saw the Ark of the Covenant. He never gazed directly upon it. And even the high priest who entered into the holies of holies, he entering once a year, his view of this ark, which speaks to us of Christ, was not clear. You see, while our vision concerning physical things may be flawless, it is flawed in regard to spiritual things. Our vision of Christ at very best is dulled and blurred. And he's speaking to the Corinthians. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I I'm known. In the original, the word darkly there is the word from which we get our English word enigma. That's a very interesting word. Winston Churchill, during the Second World War, addressing the Houses of Parliament, he said, I cannot forecast to you the actions of Russia. It is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. You get the meaning. In other words, Paul was saying here that he could not see Christ clearly. He was shrouded in mystery. And while Christ is our Redeemer, yet in another sense, he is a riddle. We cannot fully see or understand him. Have you ever looked at yourself, maybe in an old burnished brass vase. And as you've looked at yourself in that vase, you can see your outline vaguely. You can recognize it's you. But there's dents in the image that's not in your face. And so it is with us. As we lift our eye and we look, we look at Christ, but we cannot see him clearly. We cannot see him perfectly. Our vision at the very best is blurred. Robert Murray McShane, taking up his pen, he wrote, When I stand before the throne, dressed in beauty not my own, when I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. And it's not 
until that day when we stand before Christ that we will be able to see him in all his glory and majesty. That we'll be able to understand his ways and understand his workings. Until then, our vision is blurred. Until then, we don't understand everything. We can't understand all about his person. We cannot understand his workings. We at times can't understand why he's bringing us in a certain direction. It is hidden from us. My, our vision is not clear. Not only do we notice its coverings, but surely we notice its crown. Overlaying it with gold, we read in verse 11, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without, shalt thou overlay it, and thou shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about it. Of course, a crown is symbolic. It speaks to us of power. In fact, this Ark of the Covenant was the Lord's throne on earth. And it's important to notice here that it was to be made of gold. In other words, it was not a crown of shame. A crown around this Ark of the Covenant which speaks of Christ. It was a crown of glory. It was a, a crown of majesty and splendor. And while Christ was crowned with a crown of thorns, he is today crowned in triumph. He rules over all in majesty and in power. In fact, beholding him, Paul said in Hebrews 2, 2 verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. While he was made a little lower than the angels, he was crowned with glory. In other words, his reign extended not only over the garden and over the globe and over galaxies, but being crowned with glory. He rules over all. In fact, the psalmist, lifting his eyes, he cried out in that 99th psalm, the Lord reigneth. You see, while Christ is the servant of his people, he is the sovereign of all people. He's crowned with many crowns. Someone rightly said, man drives, but it is God who holds the reins. In fact, things don't just happen, but they're brought about by the hand of God. My Lord, sometimes I think as Christians, we come to the Ark of the Covenant, and we look at it, but we miss seeing the cry. We miss seeing that Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, that he is my supreme in his government and in his reign. He is crowned today. The world is not running out of control. The Lord reigns. He reigns. But I think as we look at this Ark of the Covenant, we not only see the chest of the Ark, but we should also notice the contents of the Ark. According to Hebrews chapter 4, he was to place three things inside the Ark. The tables of the law, the golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod which budded. And from these we notice here the provision in Christ. Taking up the subject, Paul tells us, Hebrews 9, verse 4, And the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna. Of course, manna was the children of Israel's food as they traveled through the howling wastes of the wilderness, gathering it early in the morning, they bringing it to their tent. They placed it there upon a mortar pounding it until it was completely ground. They then, cooking it, it had 
the taste as of honey. An omer of this bread was sufficient to feed a single man. And as such, in carrying the ark with them, it reminded them that Christ, having been broken and having been passed through the fires of divine judgment, he was now able to meet their need. And every time they would have lifted their eyes and they saw the Ark of the Covenant going in front of them and knowing that the manna was in there, they knew that God was able to meet their need. And you see, Christ this morning, yes, he's sweet, but far more than that, he is sufficient. He's able to meet our every need. And he's speaking of the manna. The Lord said in John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth in me shall never thirst. He wasn't saying here that in coming to him they would never have another want. Or that they would never have another need or have another desire. What he was saying was if they came to him, he would meet that every day need. You see, in Christ, there is not only salvation, there is satisfaction. He's able to meet our every need. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, wrote, no fear that his resources will prove unequal to the emergency. And his resources are mine, for he is mine, and is with me and dwells in me. You see, when God's work is done in God's way, it always has God's supply. There's always provision. You see, child of God, this morning in him, there is wisdom. In him, there is wealth. In him, there is strength. In him, there is all that you could ever need. There is all that you could ever desire. Yes, the way at times is hard. The path is sometimes is stricken with drought. But if you rest in Christ, you'll never want. He'll meet your need. And every time they, they, they saw the tabernacle, every time they saw the Ark of the Covenant going in front of them, they were reminded God was able to meet their need. And believer, this morning, that's our comfort. The way may be dark, but the Lord's able to meet our need. Not only do we see there their provision in Christ, but we see the the perfection of Christ. Look, Hebrews 9, verse 4. And the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. By the tables of the covenant, he was referring here to the Ten Commandments receiving the first tables of the law, Moses coming down the mountain and beholding the people in an orgy of dancing and merriment around the golden calf. He took those tables and he cast them down upon the ground, breaking them in pieces. The Lord then replaced the tables of the law. And Moses taking now these tables of the law Uh, He he placed them within the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant, which speaks of Christ, there these tables were kept perfectly preserved. They were preserved. You see, Christ not only formulated the law, but he fulfilled the law. He kept its every detail for you and for me. Indeed, the Lord said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the, destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill it. The word fill there not only carries the idea of complete, but it means to fill right up to the top. Instead of destroying the law, the Lord Jesus was saying, yeah, I came to complete the law. I came to fulfill. 
his every detail. Or as one writer put it, he came to unfold the law and to embody it in living form. You see, as well as loving us, Christ lived for us. He kept the law for us. Sometimes in life, we stop and rightly we, we, we search our hearts and we, we search our lives. And sometimes we say, I have failed. I, I have failed to keep the greatest of all the commandments. I, I have failed to love the Lord the God, my God with all of my heart. I have failed to keep the Sabbath as I ought to have kept the Sabbath. I have failed to give God his position as I ought to have given him his position. And in that moment, there needs to be repentance. There needs to be an asking God to forgive us. But child of God, remember this, that Christ kept every part of the law for you. So that when you feel your soul is not lost. He has fulfilled the law. He has kept it in every detail so that in that great day he can present me as righteous before his Father's throne. Oh, what a truth. Christ kept the law for you. He kept it for me. Of course, that's not a reason for sin. That's not a reason for slackness. That should my drive us to our knees in gratitude to cry, Lord, make me as holy as is possible for a redeemed sinner ever to be. Oh, believer, today Christ kept the law for us. I think also as we look into that ark, we see the priesthood of Christ because in Hebrews 9, verse 4, we're told wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded. In Numbers chapter 16 and 17, we find the Lord telling every tribe to go and to take a rod and to put their name upon that rod and bringing it before the Lord, the, 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 the rod that belonged to a tribe that budded, the rod budded, then they became priests unto him. And the rod being placed within the ark. It would have reminded the children of Israel that the Lord was their priest. He was their great high priest. You see, as well as being our savior, Christ is our supplicator. He takes our cause and he pleads it before our Father's throne. The writer said, through manifold temptation, my soul holds on its course. Christ's mighty intercession alone is my resource. My gracious high priest's pleadings, who on the cross did bleed, bring down God's grace and blessing and helps in hour of need. And how good it is to know in life we have a great high priest. We have one who sees our feelings before we fall. We have one who prays for us. One whom the Father will never refuse. And as the children of Israel looked, they would have been reminded of these things. And it's good for us to stop this morning. It's good for us to remember in Christ there is provision. That Christ has fulfilled the law. To remember that he's praying for us. It's that what gets us through the trials and troubles of life. But not only do we have the chest of the ark and the contents of the ark, but I want you to notice briefly the career of the ark, symbolizing the Lord's presence. Notice here, it was a continuous presence. Look at verse 15. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. These rings and staves, they made the ark uh, portable. And you notice that the staves were never to be taken out of the Ark of the Covenant. In other words, this Ark, it was always to be ready. Ready when the symbol, the signal was given to go. Even when they went down into the depths of the Red Sea, the Ark, which symbolized Christ's presence, went down with them. Child of God, take heart. Christ's presence is an abiding presence. He always goes with us. 
and he's sending his disciples as a sheep amongst the wolves. He said in Matthew chapter 29, verse 20, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Why do we need to fear? The Lord goes with us. As the Ark of the Covenant was ready to move, and they were never left without the Ark of the Covenant. So, child of God, we have his presence. He's with us, with us every day. Not only a continuous presence, it was a conducting presence. Numbers 10, verse 33. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them to search out a resting place for them. It going before them, they lifting their eyes, they would have been able to keep their eye firmly fixed upon it. That's why going down into the waters of the Red Sea, they went 5,000 abreast. It was so that they could never lose sight of the Ark of the Covenant. And as they kept their eye upon it, the Ark guided them. It directed them through the wilderness. You see, the issue today is not so much one of possession as it is one of our, our, our position. Christ is in front of us. And if we keep him in the front of our lives, then he'll guide us and, and direct us. You know, an old grandfather one day asked his grandson, would he go for a walk with him? The wee boy looked up and says, Grandad, tell me, where are you going? And the old man never spoke a word. He turned on his heels. He went out the door and out the gate and away he went. Left the wee boy behind. When the grandad finally came back home, the little boy came up to him and he said, Grandpa, why didn't you take me with you? The old man said, because you asked. Tell me where you're going first. If you had really wanted to go with me, it wouldn't have mattered to you where I was going. You don't need to know where you're going. You don't need to know when you're going. You don't even need to know why you're going. All you need to do is go. All you need to do is lift your eyes and follow. Can you picture the children of Israel? There they are in the wilderness. They're worshiping. And then all of a sudden the cloud begins to move and they take the Ark of the Covenant and they follow on. If the Lord was to move, are you ready to go? If the Lord was to go in a different direction this morning, are you ready to go with him? Are you ready to follow him? Child of God, keep your eye upon him. But you know, it was also a conquering presence. In Numbers 14, they going to battle without the Ark. What happened? you remember that they were defeated. But carrying it down into the, the raging waters of the Jordan, what happened? The waters simply divided open. They took it up and they carried it around the walls of Jericho. Those walls rose high into the heavens. They were strong. They were guarded. And what happened? The walls came tumbling down. You see, without Christ, we're weak. But with Christ, we are winner, winners. There is no problem, there is no power, there is no person that we cannot overcome. Oh, child of God, make sure in life that you never lose sight of Jesus. Make sure that your eye is fixed upon him. Mary and Joseph made their way up to Jerusalem. And they supposed, they supposed he's bound to be there. But when they stopped and looked to their horror, he was not there. And is there not that constant danger in life? We're so busy with life, so busy with activities that we just go on. We, we take for granted, that's what the Lord wants. He wants me to do this thing. He wants me to go that way. That door is open. We just take it for granted. And then we discover he's not there. Can you imagine the disaster if Israel had marched and not took the Ark of the Covenant? 
as we have seen, they were defeated. We need to have the Lord with us. He is the ark of the covenant. He is our Lord. Believer, make sure that your eye is always fixed upon him. And if you're not saved, then I urge you today to come to the door. Christ is the door. To throw your dependence upon the sacrifice of Christ that was offered at Calvary. And being saved, then come to the laver. Wash away those defilements. Enter into the place of communion. And come before the Lord. May God help us to see him and to walk with him and to serve him. Amen. We're going to close our service by singing just two verses of the hymn, 429. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go, anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him, dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. The hymn 429, again we're keeping our seats, singing just two verses, singing softly. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice that thou hast not left us to ourselves, but we thank thee for thy abiding presence. And we pray, Lord, that we might not take thy presence for granted, but that we might every day make sure that we are walking in thy way, which is perfect. We pray that thou wouldst part us even now with thy blessing. Lord, in these days, keep us safe, we ask of thee. Keep thy protecting hand upon us. And we pray that you would meet with us in this place again this evening. For we ask these things in thy name and for thy glory. Amen. Amen.